Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Happy uh, almost mid-August. It's great to be here to facilitate the final segment of our Earth Kind Energy Clean Energy Series. And Ron Kamen, we have learned so much from you these past weeks. Thank you for all you have done. If anyone who is on today has missed the past ones, they live on the Business Council of Westchester website in our Business Resource Center at thebcw.org. Um, the, there, we have a terrific, very, very interesting program for you today, really talking about investing with green energy values and by investing that way, outperforming. We love that. And so we thank you all, um, the, the sponsors, uh, of course, Ron Kamet and Earthkind Energy and our co-sponsors of this series, Atlantic Westchester, NYSERDA, Sunrise Solar, Hell Wealth Partners, who's here with us today, and their team, Rightcore, and ZBF Ge uh, Geothermal. Uh, we have a lot planned for you in September at the BCW, including our Green Business Awards, our 10th anniversary in September. So I will, I will put the date up on, up on chat or if Danny Glazer is on, uh, if she can do it, that would be great. And we thank you all for participating and for all that you do. It's my pleasure now to turn this over to Ron Kamen, the founder, CEO, and clean energy thought leader from Earthkind Energy Consulting. Ron? Thank you so much, Marsha. And thank you to the BCW team, um, Amanda and Yvette and Marsha and John and everybody else that's there. And folks, for this is the last of the six in the series. And as I've uh, stressed before, I've worked for over three decades in clean energy. I've met and worked with hundreds of business organizations and councils throughout the state and the United States. And I can truthfully say that the Business Council of Westchester by far is the most engaged, supportive, active, and just incredible business organization I've ever met. And if you live, work, or do business in Westchester, or want to do business in Westchester, you should absolutely become a member of the BCW. So thank you, Marsha. Thank you, BCW. And let's launch into this program. Um, we're going to start, as we said, uh, as Marsha said, this is responsible investing, in investing with green energy values and outperforming the market. We've got an outstanding panel for you today that's going to talk about the $18 trillion worth of investments in the clean energy space worldwide and how that now outperforms the market and is actually less risky and better performing than hydrocarbons. And we have an outstanding panel I'll introduce in a moment. But as is my want, I would like you to please take a deep breath. I'm going to ring a chime and I'm asking you to hold your breath for 20 seconds in memory of all those we've lost and who took their last breath in 2020. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have a, a piece I'm going to share with you now that, um, that basically I think frames it off really well. This was done by a Westchester, actually a, a recent graduate of Westchester who's now in college. Um, but I think it explains pretty clearly what we need to do and also my next step in this venture. So if you would. Energy is central to civilization. Well, How is our No sound. One moment. and buildings gets us around and transports our food and goods. The lives of everyone we love and know are threatened by dirty, unhealthy, and unsustainable. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I think we'll stop that share. And uh, can people hear me now? So sorry for that. 
Okay, well, um, I will share that video in the chat recording later. Basically, it's a 90-second video that talks about where we are in the world, what we need to do, how we need to make this transition. And one of the things that you'll realize very quickly is that we need to make this change in a short period of time. A lot of people don't think we can, we must. And the fascinating thing to me is that we already have made these changes, not only with the supercomputers that we now have in the palm of everybody's smartphone, which has more computing power in our hands than we had when we put people on the moon 50 years ago. It's more power than a supercomputer from 10 years ago. And this is what we did last century when in 1900, it was all horses and one car in New York City. And you know how long it took to make that transition to all cars and one horse was 13 years. That was it. We've done it. We can do it. This transition needs to happen. And today we're going to hear from those folks that are most responsible for the investments. You guys can see all this, by the way, this slide. Just shake your head, Jerry. No, nope, you can't see it, eh? Ah. Oh, boy. Here we are. Can you see it now? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. 13 years it took. So sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. We're, uh, I'm, Wow. Not sure exactly what happened, but basically this is the uh, transition that we made in 13 years last century from all horses to, to all cars. And that's what we need to do now with clean energy across the board. And with that, I'm going to introduce the panelists. We're Jerry Pell, Jerry Eisman Pell, who is the private wealth advisor and chief executive officer of Pell Wealth Partners, a private wealth advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial, Enterprise, Financial Services. And in addition to many national recognitions, Jerry, Jerry has appeared on pretty much every TV show, on business news shows, and she's been quoted in written articles for the Wall Street Journals, the New York Times, USA Today, Financial Planners, and a whole host of others. Jerry is joined by Julie Wendolt, Wendholt, also of Pell Wealth Partners, accredited portfolio manager advisor who focuses on helping clients align their investments with positive social and environmental impact. Also now, Jer Julie is going to introduce our panel, which is Lenore Reiner, Vice President of Eaton Vance Distributors and Senior Responsible Investment Strategy Spe Specialist for Eaton Vance's suite of strategies focusing on responsible investing, encompassing the U.S. and international equity and fixed income strategies and asset allocation funds. Lenore is going to be followed by John Wilson, who's Vice President as well of Calvert Research and Management, a wholly owned subsidiary of Eaton Vance. John is responsible for overseeing Calvert's systematic research on critical environmental, social, and government governance ESG topics that help improve long-term corporate value and or environmental and societal outcomes. And last, John Miller is a Vice President, ESG Senior Research Analyst for Calvert, and he'll be responsible for environmental, social, and governance uh, covering the global energy and utility sectors. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Julie and... Jerry. To Jerry, Julie, and Lenore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to take that first. This is Jerry. And... Um, I don't know if you can see me or if somebody can switch the slide to me, but I just want to start off by saying that um, we decided to sponsor and we decided to take this opportunity to talk to everyone because at Pell Wealth Partners, we believe really strongly that investing with your values and getting a competitive rate of return are not mutually exclusive. And you'll see very soon that, as a matter of fact, you can get a better rate of return and that your investments can one day change the world. That is a very strong belief of ours. I have been working in this area since 1986, and I have been working with Calvert for almost all of that time. And so I thought I'd bring in some of my experts to talk about that. So we're going to start off with a presentation by Lenore Reiner. And Lenore, why don't you take it away and give us some of the background and really good information on what's going on in this space.
Happy to, Jerry. Thank you for that introduction. And it certainly has been a pleasure to work with you uh, throughout all these years. And it's our goal, uh, hope, and intention that this presentation will empower and inspire you to take action and to consider how you can integrate your values into your investing portfolio. Uh, many of you have been part of this uh, series, so clearly you're concerned about climate change. And so we're going to talk about how you can integrate climate change and other pressing socioeconomic and environmental challenges. Uh, into your investing portfolio uh, with the intention of trying to drive positive change uh, as well as uh, to achieve uh, to maximize investment outcomes. So we have a very robust agenda that we're going to go through very quickly, but we're going to define what exactly is responsible investing and why it matters. What are some trends that have been underway and talk to you a little bit about Calvert and how it is that we achieve our dual mandate to achieve long term shareholder value and positive global impact simultaneously. So to begin, even before this this pandemic, there were all sorts of societal issues that were caused by adverse corporate behavior, all sorts of headlines that have impacted society that also have the potential to impact your investing portfolio. As it relates to the topic today, of course, everyone can remember the California wildfires that completely obliterated certain uh, communities. Um, so companies can be the source of the solution, but also the source of the problem. And so responsible investing is around integrating careful scrutiny of how well companies manage their environmental, social and governance capital to uncover risks uh, and opportunities with the hope of maximizing returns and driving positive change. Now companies really are differentiated in how they manage their environmental and social capital and how that they're governed. So increasingly investors are turning to lists such as the top top 100 most sustainable companies list and really are looking to invest in companies that at the very least are having a net positive societal impact. Now, many of us impact investors that are drawn into this space because we want to make a difference with our investing capital are using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a roadmap. Now, these were developed by nation states uh, to create an organized framework, if you will, to essentially address ra um, rampant socioeconomic and environmental challenges by the year of 2030. Certainly very um, ambitious. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating many of the goals that um, many of the issues that these goals are trying to solve. So it's incumbent now more than ever that we're incredibly thoughtful in terms of the companies we support, the products we buy, and increasingly the investing portfolios that we create. Uh, and so you can be thoughtful through integrating uh, responsible investing into your uh, investment portfolio. Now, this is broadly defined as the integration of environmental, social, and government its factors into investment decisions to better manage risk and also to generate sustainable long-term returns. Now, what do we mean by ESG? Uh, environment would be many of the things that you're, that you're already familiar with, but what is the carbon footprint of the company? What sort of toxic emissions uh, do they emit? Uh, what, how do they source their energy? How efficient are they in, use, in their use of energy, as some examples? Under social, we more or less consider how are workers treated within the, within the company? Does the company embrace a diverse and inclusive culture? Uh, what is the impact of the products from these companies? Do companies um, also issues that impact people like data security and consumer privacy? And then lastly, also governance. How is the company governed? What are the ethics? What is the composition of the board? Uh, collectively, these are uh, known as off-balance sheet uh, assets and increasingly how well companies manage these off-balance sheet assets uh, really is important to how companies will perform uh, and their impact on society broadly. Uh, Perhaps as no surprise, climate change is a dominant theme and concern among investors. Governments across the globe are introducing more climate uh, related regulations. And so we expect commitments to net zero emissions by companies and investors to become standard practice by the end of the decade. All sectors will participate in the transition to the low carbon economy because companies recognize the risks and opportunities linked to proactively addressing climate change. Many firms will look to seize new business opportunities and position themselves as climate leaders. And at the same time, investors will increase engagements around climate change and will look to incorporate climate risk into their voting policies, as we're gonna learn about a little bit later, going so far as to vote against the boards that are laggards on the issues such as climate change. 
So who's interested broadly in responsible investing? Well, there's values-based investors like you and I that really want to be thoughtful in terms of the companies that we support and the impact that we drive. But increasingly, we are seeing increased interest from traditional investors who are recognizing that these are important financially material risks and opportunities that they have to consider uh, and ultimately are going to want to invest in those companies um, that are offering a net positive to, to society. Now, trends that have been underway is overwhelming growth in this space of responsible investing. According to a recent survey from Morgan Stanley, 85% of individuals are interested in this space and want to have a conversation with their financial advisor. And perhaps not surprisingly, 95% of millennials are also interested in this space. And this is having a profound impact on companies who are responding. What you're looking at on this graph here are the, if, the proliferation of the issuance of corporate sustainability reports reports, where essentially companies are reporting to shareholders, potential shareholders, employees, and customers, how they are managing their environmental, social, and governance uh, capital, if you will. And so as you can see at the beginning of the last decade, only 20% of the S&P 500 were issuing these reports. Now we're closer to 90%. Now it's beyond the scope of the presentation to always talk about the quality of these reports, but suffice to say, we are getting more information from these companies, which is enabling us to make much more informed choices, as you will hear a little bit later uh, from, from some of our later uh, presenters. So as it relates to um, performance integrating ESG, the business case for ESG investing is grounded in the aggregated results of over 2,200 empirical studies of the relationship between ESG considerations and performance. The Journal of Sustainable Finance and Investment considered the primary studies that found a positive, negative, and neutral correlation between ESG factors and performance. The results in the bar graph that you're looking at on this slide here count the highest correlation as the outcome for a particular study. The studies analyzed various asset classes and considered issuers located around the world. A majority of the studies and, and bond of stock and bond investments showed positive correlation between financial performance and ESG factors. And so what has happened over the course of the last couple of decades is that this field has evolved away from just an outright exclusions-based approach or negative screening to this more ESG integrated approach, where what you are doing essentially is doing traditional fundamental analysis, but carefully scrutinizing how well companies are managing their environmental, social, and governance capital to uncover risks and opportunities. So this integrated approach really gives you a more holistic or comprehensive view of the inherent, inherent risks and opportunities that you could potentially be exposed to. Now, this field has taken off and continues to take off. According to the United States Social Investment Forum, which is a nonprofit that tracks assets in this space, uh, it noted that at the end of 2018, $12 trillion was invested with some sort of ESG label. Uh, and that's up from $8.7 trillion from two years ago. Uh, the next report from the United States Social Investment Forum is due at the end of this year. And due to the net asset flows that continue to pour in, naturally that number is going to be much higher. And so as a result of this overwhelming demand and this growth from both retail and institutional investors, uh, asset managers are now also uh, significantly offering more strategies that integrate ESG into their portfolio. Uh, so this, is, this creates good news for you as an investor because you really do have a whole lot of opportunities to build a very diversified and robust portfolio. But the challenge to you is that there is no one standard way to do this. And so I strongly encourage you and I commend you for being here, but I do encourage you to follow up with Jerry and Julie to, to talk further about how you can integrate your values into your portfolio and to ensure that they steer you with the right asset managers, the right asset mix, and make sure that your values that you care about are uh, properly integrated into your overall portfolio. Now, as you heard from Jerry uh, in her opening comments, uh, she has partnered with Calvert pretty much since we've been in business. Uh, we actually got started uh, to take us in this space as a fixed income asset management firm on Calvert Street in Washington, D.C. We actually got into the space then known as socially responsible investing, which was more of an exclusions-based approach at the time, really to take a stand on what was going on in apartheid with South Africa. So we developed a uh, equity mutual fund with a formal prohibition against supporting apartheid in, in South Africa. Over the course of the last 40 years, we've obviously continued to grow uh, and expand, but suffice to say, we have long been committed to achieving our dual mandate, and that is to deliver 
deliver long-term shareholder value and positive global impact simultaneously. And we do this in three main ways. First of all, responsible investing is our core and exclusive focus. It's all that we do. We're not adding this uh, to our lineup because it's popular today. It, these are um, factors that we've been long been committed to over the course of the last couple of years. We're also very thoughtful in terms of the companies that we invest in. And so we've developed a proprietary principles-based research system that, evals, uh, that allows us to evaluate, rank, and score companies on how well they manage their most financially material, environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities. The latter half of this presentation is going to talk a little bit further about how we do the research that we do, particularly as it relates uh, to the energy and the utility sector. Now, suffice to say, the outcome of our process are a series of scores and reports on companies that we use to determine eligibility. But no company within our universe gets a perfect score. So that means that all companies have room to improve in some form or another in how they manage an environmentally, social, or governance risk and opportunity. And so this creates ripe opportunities for engagement, which is going to be another topic that we are going to explore. The goal of engagement, engagement is a very powerful tool that we seek to strengthen companies and thereby our position as a shareholder in the company. And when we strengthen these companies, we we increase our chances of achieving long-term shareholder value. And when we encourage companies to make these changes, we then have the potential to drive positive change on many pressing socioeconomic and environmental challenges like climate change, as you're gonna hear later in this presentation. Now, while we do prefer to have a direct dialogue with companies, sometimes uh, we do need to either file shareholder proposals uh, or uh, when others have filed shareholder proposals, we take advantage of the opportunity to vote our proxies. And so at Calvert, we vote our proxies in alignment with our proxy voting guidelines. And as you will see, uh, often this means we have to vote against management on many environmental, social and governance issues. Now, before I conclude, uh, I do want to say that there is a common misconception that integrating ESG considerations into the investment process requires the investor to sacrifice returns. At Calvert, we understand and believe that focusing on sustainability will not only benefit society, but investors looking to achieve favorable investment results. And so within the Calvert universe, we, are, we uh, have 28 different uh, mutual funds across the global capital markets. But again, to decide if these are appropriate for you from us or from other firms, again, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to Pell uh, Wealth uh, Partners. So as I near the end of my presentation, these are just some considerations to have in the back of your mind uh, as you reach out and as you think about integrating responsible investing into your, uh, into your portfolios. So I'd like to uh, just end here again by encouraging you to reach out um, with Jerry and her team. And what I'd now like to do is uh, share the floor, turn the floor over to Julie at well Pell Wealth Partners, uh, who's going to interview John Miller uh, to talk, take a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of how we at Calvert research companies and determine their eligibility, but really focusing in on uh, the energy and the utility sector. Great, thank you, Lenore. I appreciate the introduction. And John, I'm very much looking forward to asking you about um, the energy and utility space and how you determine what companies to invest in. Um, so question one is, can you please describe how you and your team apply an ESG lens to determine eligibility for the Calvert universe? Thank you, Julie. Appreciate that question. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's it's the, the space that we live in every single day here in Calvert. Um, as Lenore noted that you know, our entire process is ESG based. It is not a bolt on to you know, traditional fundamental equity analysis or, or done as, as a side to uh, other processes. It's core to what we do. So uh, how do we use that lens? It, it, it's just core to everything we do. So we, we go out on our own to acquire data and information that we think is relevant. We research the sector, we try and understand themes, and then we build out our proprietary models, which Lenore spoke to earlier. And, and with those tools, we can then feed that information to our portfolio managers, we can feed that to the research team for a wider study, and we can, we can share that internally with our engagement team, which we'll hear from John Wilson in a few moments, so he can then use that information as actionable 
and really push for positive change in the companies that we own in our portfolio. Great, thank you. And can I ask what are the material ESG factors for the utility sector that you cover? Sure, sure. So now we're really getting into the, the, the deep dive here on, on the topic. And yeah, I think I'd start from just a little bit further back. At, at Calvert, we really view utilities positively. We see them as critical actors in the ongoing energy transition. You know, they play a critical role in connecting supply of electricity, supply of natural gas, if it's a gas utility or water, to their, their downstream final client. And that client, in this case, is the individual customer. I'm going to note that a lot of people on this call probably had uh, several hours or maybe even days last week where they had service interruptions. Um, I think that it, it's, it's tough, it's difficult, it's, especially in this time period where we're living, working at home and during the summer period, but it really highlights just how essential utilities are to modern life and the modern economy. And if we really want to see changes in in primary energy demand, what type of electricity are we using? What type of carbon footprint do we have as individuals? Utilities are really going to drive that conversation. So because of that, we really feel that we need to be involved and active in this space. Um, we heard earlier that the, the overall opportunity set for long-term investments in utilities is something like $18 trillion. So a very large number over about 20 years. If you break that down, it's more than 8.5 trillion in just wires, so transmission and distribution. It's more than 6 trillion in new renewable energy assets themselves. It's an additional 5 to 6 trillion in behind the meter, energy efficiency, and just ongoing maintenance capex. So we, we put those background themes together and we see sustained long-term growth in global demand for energy. We see declining prices for electricity, which are supportive of electrification of the economy which means we won't just use electricity for our homes, but we use it for heating. We're using it for mobility, so cars and trucks. We see growing national and social action to price what are current externalities in our system. And carbon is a huge externality. If you're a company that produces carbon, in most places of the world, except for the US, Northeast, California, and Europe, you know, there's no fee to that. You're basically putting that cost that's subsidized on the rest of society. We also see a trend towards de-risking of the utility structure, where utilities are becoming more interested in regulated transmission and distribution assets. So we bring all those things together. So what are the core issues that we're looking for when we're pursuing our proprietary ESG research in utilities? We're looking at how, how a utility is managing its commodity risk exposure. And historically, it was very common for a utility to own not only an electric generation facility, but potentially the coal mine that feeds that facility. It's a huge long-term risk. So we want to understand how is the utility managing that risk? How are they articulating that risk and what are they thinking going forward? We want to look at their, their asset fleet. Do they have a lot of carbon intensive generation assets? Have they already recycled those assets, sold them off or retired them? We want to look at their forward looking infrastructure program. How are they thinking about the future? Are they building resources that make sense now, but maybe in five or 10 years will be obsolete? Are they investing in natural gas or are they investing in electricity? And lastly, we want to look at their overall corporate strategy, I call their energy transition strategy and governance. How are they thinking about these risks holistically? How are they communicating that to the investor space? And how are they treating their customers? In a lot of cases, the utility customer is, is, is captured in the sense that they don't have a lot of options. They can't go shopping around their water utility bill. One way of looking at that is it's a moat. I can treat that customer however I want. Another better way of looking at that is this is an important customer we need to treat them appropriately, give them appropriate services they want at the right price. So we bring those together and we build our model. We try and rate, rank, and score issues. Great, thank you, John. Um, as someone who was uh, affected by the hurricane last week and was without power for five days, I appreciate you uh, trying to make the utility sector more sustainable, absolutely. Um, and lastly, would you please describe a leader in your sector that Calvert allows in its universe and a lagger that's not eligible? Sure, sure. So yes, we're just super sensitive that again, these, these companies touch individuals, corporations, industrials at every single level. And what I think instead of speaking to specific names, I'll add a little more of the framework of how we assess a leader, how we assess a lagger. And, and the important context here is that similar to what Lenore said earlier, no one is perfect. So uh, if, depending where you are, if you're in New York, if you have Con Ed, if you have TSEG, if you're in Connecticut, if you have Eversource, these companies are doing good things and they're also, you know, they have issues. <laughs> it's, 
you know, multiple days or weeks of not having electricity in August is clearly an issue and something that needs to be moved forward. But we try and uh, we, we try and understand broader themes and then assess those strengths and weaknesses against each other. I'd also note that specifically within U.S. equity markets, what we've seen in the past 18 months is really a sustained trend where what I'm calling ESG leveraged utilities have really seen outperformance in their equity multiples, particularly their price to equity multiple. So that means effectively that utilities that have a lower carbon footprint tend to be more transmission and distribution oriented, have seen their valuations increase uh, throughout the cycle, throughout COVID-19, throughout the risks where we are now, and compared to their peers, which are much more energy intensive. So, so who is a leader and what would a leader be doing? A leader would at this point, have already exited its legacy upstream fossil fuel business unit. They don't own coal mines anymore. That's, there's no reason to physically own a coal mine at this point. Um, they quickly transitioned um, from energy intensive coal and oil based um, generation resources to uh, potentially natural gas, but they've also moved past natural gas towards renewables. They have an intent focus on transmission and distribution and possibly a business where they're building contracted renewable assets. They see themes around decentralization behind the meter, energy efficiency, they see these as growth opportunities. They're an ally. They're not actively challenging and fighting them. And again, they view their end use clients as customers, not as a capture great base. On the other side, the laggards, pretty much the flip side. They're maintaining their legacy fossil generation business. It's their view that they've invested in it. They're gonna run it through this full 30 year depreciation period. That's their view. They're going to retain their energy intensive coal, oil, and gas assets. They have a strong focus on continuing thermal generation, um, probably deploying capital into um, less relevant sectors, uh, so large scale nuclear generation, um, CCUS, which is carbon capture or carbon capture utilization storage. It's an interesting technology. Uh, when it's been tried at the utility scale, it tends to cost billions of dollars and not work. So, uh, not, not really positive from the investor side. Um, these utilities are also fighting decentralization. They're fighting behind the meter technologies and they're fighting retail choice, which basically captures their, their clients. And lastly, they're, they're viewing again, they're, they're not seeing customers, they're seeing it capture at rate base. So no utility is perfect. They're all balance of those. What we want to find is the correct balance and, and transition and, and, and motivation and movement towards the leaders and not back towards the leaders. Great, thank you so much, John. And now uh, Jerry Pell, the CEO of our team, is going to carry on the conversation with John Miller. Wilson, I'm sorry, John Wilson. Thank you, Julie. I had to unmute. I appreciate that. Thank you, good questions. Well, I know that when I first started working in this space, one of the things that really intrigued me was learning about what shareholder engagement was. You know, I understood what investing in ethical areas were and sustainable and energy and all of that, but I didn't have any idea what, what um, shareholder engagement was. So John, what exactly is shareholder engagement and what are the goals? Um, great, so thanks for the question. and Thanks for, for having me here, it's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, so shareholder engagement, yeah, I mean, like you, know, like you a lot of people uh, think about investment in terms of investment research and selection, not so much about the voice that shareholders have in corporate governance, right? And as shareholders, we have the ability to have an impact on how the companies in our portfolios are managed and run. And so that's a very important part of, of our view of our fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders is to have a positive uh, influence on the companies in our portfolios to ensure that management is uh, working in our interests as shareholders, which means maximizing long-term value, of course, but also reflecting the kinds of values um, that our participants or our clients really, really have for us, and particularly around climate change, you know, engaging with companies to make sure that they have good climate policies, uh, you know, as John was describing, is a very important part of the engagement process, or actually the investment process. So what is engagement? So that's, that's the question. It's really about using that voice um, to, to engage in dialogue with companies to affect the, the policies and practices of that company. And so we will enter into um, these long-term uh, dialogues with companies to talk to them about these issues and try to have a positive impact. So um, there's, there's a number of different strategies that we can use. Um, 
the first one I think Lenora referenced earlier, and that is the, the proxy vote. And for those that don't know, um, every company or every public company has to have an annual meeting every year. And at that annual meeting, shareholders have the ability to vote on certain matters, like uh, to elect the directors of the company, to uh, approve the compensation uh, package of the, uh, the top executives, and other matters. And so we as shareholders have the right to express our satisfaction or dissatisfaction with, with the company through these votes, sometimes in extreme ways, for example, by removing directors. Um, so the companies pay obviously a lot of attention to the votes of their uh, shareholders. And when those votes don't go the way they want, then that's, that's an area of interest. For them. Um, a second tool, and I think uh, Lenore talked about this also, was the shareholder proposal. So as a shareholder, you have the right to add a question to the ballots that shareholders vote on at the annual meeting. So it's not just about directors and compensation. It may also be about, for example, climate change, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, file a report, um, talk about energy transition. There's a lot of different uh, kinds of uh, shareholder proposals that might be put on a proxy ballot. And so as shareholders, we will also vote, we try to vote in favor um, of those kinds of proposals in order to push management to address these kinds of issues. And it's interesting because Calvert and other shareholders have been really pushing companies to address climate change honestly since the early 1990s. So it's been a really long time. And a lot of the effort that companies have been making uh, really grow out of those particular shareholder engagements uh, that, they, that they have. So. Well, that, that's actually very, very wonderful. So that's something important for people to know that if they're not engaged in investing in companies like through Calvert and other socially responsible investments or impact investing or environmental investing or whatever you want to call it, because there are so many names, then as investors, you have no say in any of this versus being able to engage. That's so, yeah versus us being able to have a voice, which is really an unbelievable opportunity to control the direction. So um, let me ask you another question about this. So being someone who's at Calvert, so tell us about your testimony last year, which you had an opportunity to testament, to give testimony to a Senate subcommittee on the environment and public works. What did you yeah. testify about? Yeah, that was a great opportunity. And one of the, you know, one of the areas that we have a voice in is public policy. And uh, because and it's, it helps to be located in Washington, D.C. Um, but we were asked to uh, provide testimony to the um, Senate Subcommittee on Clean Air and Nuclear Energy, I believe is the, is the name of the subcommittee. And so I had a chance to talk to some senators about our perspective on the, the link between investment and climate. And I think a lot of the, the senators there really didn't have any sense that there was a link between investment and climate, but I was able to demonstrate in all the ways that John was talking about earlier, how really climate change is an, is an issue for investors and not just a values-based interest, but also in terms of our long-term fiduciary responsibility to generate performance because companies that have good climate policies tend to outperform those that don't. And more, more importantly, perhaps over the long-term, climate change itself, creates physical risks that will harm the entire market. And so our whole portfolio is at risk um, because of this. So I talked about that um, primarily um, to try to help. And I think it was really helpful for the senators to make that connection, uh, really understand that this is not just about values, it is actually about economics. Um, the other thing that I was able to say was how many investors are now involved in the, 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 you know, the work on climate change. It's not just you know, specifically ESG investors, mainstream investors have taken this on and are pushing companies to disclose more and take more action uh, to address the issue of climate change. And then lastly, I was able to say, the, the last missing piece of this is federal policy, right? Because what we lack, we understand the future is, is in clean energy and the future is in low carbon, but we lack the specific signal that good federal policy could, could provide that really makes the case for all investors and all companies that they need to be moving in this direction. So that's the missing piece of the puzzle right now. And that was my, um, I think, most important message to the senators there. So I had a chance to address you know, both sides of the aisle, uh, people with very different perspectives, but I, I think it was very well received. That's wonderful. So can, um, 
Maybe you can talk to us broadly on your various engagement initiatives as it relates to the environment. And I'll just throw in, I know that um, I've been involved in this industry for certainly long enough and been at conferences that I've heard about initiatives where shareholders and, and companies have gone to um, fast food places and convince them to fish sustainably and change yep. their fish sandwiches or change their packaging. And yep. so they might not have great labor regulations, but, or, you know, be paying more than the minimum wage, but they've changed their packaging because it was proved that it could save them money and be better for the environment or fish sustainably. And so piece by piece, bit by bit. So those are all great examples of things that came out of shareholder initiatives. So give us some of yours. Yeah, sure. Great. And I'll, by the way, I'll just mention uh, with the quick serve industry, we've also been working on labor issues. So just, just, yeah, that we have I know. Yes, I know that. <laughs> Um, and Amanda, you can show my picture once in a while. I'll be okay with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we, we, when, we're, when we're talking about climate change, really it's about, number one, a commitment um, to action, and number two, uh, about um, the governance mechanisms to drive change and to create incentives for change, and third, measuring the outcome. So let me talk about a particular company, and I, by the way, the compliance people won't let me name the company, so I will just have to say a company. Um, this is a utility company um, that uh, we engage with. This is a company that was reliant, particularly, uh, believe it or not, on oil for generation, which is very unusual for companies these days. Oil happens to be both the most expensive and the, 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 the dirtiest uh, fuel, uh, I, I guess, but other than coal um, for, for a utility. And so this particular company had made commitments to um, you know, to, to invest in renewable energy and to improve its carbon footprint, but had not been successful in actually executing on that plan. And having to do with their relationship with regulators, um, their own investment capabilities, uh, there was a failed uh, merger that took place. And so it really wasn't working, basically. So this company had, had expressed um, an interest in renewables, but had not delivered. And that was the, the, the focus of our engagement was how do we get this company to kind of right the ship and move forward in a productive way, in a way that it's already acknowledged, it should be moving. So this was not about convincing them about the importance of climate change. It was about convincing them of the importance of actually executing on the plans. And so with this particular company, we were able to get them firstly to appoint two new board members who had expertise in sustainability and renewable energy. So now they had a little bit more capability in leadership positions, and, and they also hired a new CEO, who is also very committed and passionate about renewable energy. So they, they were moving in terms of their leadership. And then they also adopted um, in, their, uh, in their compensation plans, renewable energy targets. And this is important because what you pay executives for tends to become the priority for the company, as you might imagine. And so by incorporating renewable energy targets into compensation, then we have a lot more um, faith that the company has created the right kinds of incentives to move forward. So um, now we've been sort of monitoring to see how this is all playing out. And we've actually seen that the company has actually started to move forward. It takes a while, it's a long process, but they've started to move forward on uh, their renewable energy goals. They're making more investments. I think their, their relationships with the regulators is improving. And so we are starting to see this company becoming unstuck. And we hope this company will become a leader in renewable energy going forward because it certainly could benefit from doing so. So that's, that's one example. Um, another example is a company that uh, manufactures uh, trucks. So these are, you know, kind of the, the big uh, delivery trucks. And was very kind of hesitant. They have a, a business model that had really been very similar for a very long time. Uh, they weren't thinking about uh, climate change much in terms of the development of their vehicles. But again, as a part of our engagement with them, we were able to talk about the evolution of the market, how uh, many firms, Amazon being just one example, are starting to look at their logistics and the climate uh, footprint of their logistics operations and demanding kind of fleets of vehicles that meet those particular targets. And so after a period of years, this company developed what we call a science-based target for, uh, for, for its greenhouse gas emissions, which essentially means they're saying, okay, what is the contribution of our operations and our product to climate change? And what kind of reduction target 
would give us a meaningful contribution to you know, meeting the Paris climate goals or other kind of uh, national or international goals that we might set. So this company really, this is less about execution and more about commitment, getting the company to see the importance for its business really because of the demand that's emerging for uh, this kind of technology and how it's going to stay relevant in a changing market. So that was also another success. The next step will be, okay, does the, the, does the, do the operations, do the products actually change as a result? So this is a long-term kind of engagement with the company and it's still ongoing, but I think we've made some progress. So that's, that's two examples for you right there. That's, that's great. And thank you so much. So I think, you know, what I wanted to kind of demonstrate to everybody by pulling all of this together is that going back to what I said, that our investments can one day change the world. And we can do that by being shareholders and getting involved through engagement by either letting the, you know, Calvert and other companies like that in this space go out and speak for us about things that we believe in and by investing in companies that are really being proactive to make amazing, amazing changes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to something in a second, but I wanna go to um, one follow-up question for the three people from Calvert. Um, and that is, can either of you give our audience an example of a company that has just knocked it out of the park, you know, because like you said, this used to be a screening industry, which is like, don't invest in guns, tobacco, gambling, things like that. So, you know, I can think of examples, for example, on, you know, water's going to be the next oil. So from a global basis, you know, um, things that have to do with the delivery, the technology, the infrastructure of water. So what investments has Calvert made in something that's really gone up in value that's been innovative in the energy water um, we do i know you do a lot of investing also in women um things like that i'll take anybody lenore you might be a good person for that okay. well unfortunately like we said we can't name any names. i'm not looking for a name i'm looking for a description of the company i mean i think that that really excites people when they're looking to make investments like Okay, so what do you got? <laughs> you know, what's really yeah. good? Well, if, if you don't mind me lobbying it over to John, um, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a certain um, u utility that you invest in that seems to rank very high. If you could maybe describe the characteristics because not only does it have such a strong ESG profile, it's really been rewarded significantly on the financial side as well. So maybe you could describe that company for everybody. Sure. And by the way, before you do that, yeah, if sure, you sure. want to call me, mm -hmm. Jerry, I can certainly talk names and I can talk all yeah. about the portfolio and I can talk about all the details. And so can <laughs> Julie. We're happy to talk about it with you. Go ahead, John. <laughs> I've, I'm happy to talk about it with you too as well um, in, right, in, in a different in context, but, but for sure. That we can't. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, what, we, we can provide, um, you know, guidelines uh, or outlines of, of certain companies in this space. And I, I've already spoken quite a bit about utilities, so I'll maybe just highlight one name outside of the utility space, more in the traditional oil and gas. So in the sector basis, it would be energy. Um, so there are segments of the economy that are not well positioned to translate to electrification. So there's heavy trucking, heavy transportation, aviation, um, some industrial processes that really require the, the energy components that are found in a molecule. And right now that molecule is, is mainly uh, oil or refined oil. So there are one or two names um, that are in the refining and marketing space that have identified this as, as a niche and said, well, these segments of the economy probably won't be electrified in the next 15, 20, 30 years. Can we provide an alternative solution that isn't oil-based, provides that energy component that's found in the molecule. And so most people are probably very, very familiar with corn-based ethanol. That's sort of biofuel 1.0. We're now at 3.0 and above, when we call these advanced or renewable diesels. These are, these are products that aren't based off uh, inputs from vegetables or crops. So they don't affect the, the food supply. They don't affect the farming situation, which is already stressed from climate change and water access. In most cases, these renewable diesels are using waste products. And they're, they're waste products that we don't even think of. So 
Uh, we've already talked about fast food in, in a couple of different contexts here. Fast food produces a lot of um, animal fat and oil fat waste. These wastes can be captured and then reused and turned into renewable diesels, which when they're burned, they don't emit, emit CO2, they don't emit sulfur, they don't even actually have any emissions other than water. So there's a, a number of firms that have identified this in this space and they operate kind of uh, somewhere between a traditional refiner where they have large infrastructure storage assets, but they're also chemical and science-based companies where they source these fats, they source fats from uh, agricultural um, you know, cattle, sheep, um, chickens. In Asia, they, they, they source these fats from the large um, fishing infrastructure, and they translate that into fuels, which are effectively drop-ins. So I could take jet fuel from traditional oil, or I could take jet fuel that's created from fish waste, fish waste fat. These firms have significantly outperformed because they're in a very unique space. They have patents and IP around this technology, and they're producing a fuel that allows um, segments of the economy that are otherwise kind of cornered to, to decarbonize. So if you're an airline, you have a couple options. You can buy offsets, or you can try and find a, a more lower intensive fuel. And so that's the better option. So that, that's one, one, uh, one space I'd highlight. On the utility side, in, in the US, there's, there's sort of been a clear outperformer from the financial side. And this is a firm that, that really understood about 10 years ago that the utility space was changing. Um, the expectation that the fossil fuels were going to be expensive, that you know, large thermal assets were going to be the way to go. They looked at that and they said, no, I think a lot of things are changing. Um, we're producing a lot more oil and gas that's going to depress prices, that's going to make thermal generation non-competitive. And also the government's really getting serious about uh, production tax credits, investment tax credits. You think that, you know, solar is important, it's going to grow rapidly, but right now the, the, the technology that can be commoditized, that can be really rolled out, at scale is wind. So we're going to get really, really big into wind. And what that means is we understand you know, what, what a PTC is, what state renew renewable portfolio standards are, but we're also going to make inroads into the, the upstream infrastructure such that we have a supply chain advantage that when someone wants to get a, a power purchase agreement or be able to, to have wind power on their system, we can come to you at such a low cost that we are the dominant player. And we're going to be able to do this such that when the PTCs, when the ITCs, when all these credits roll off, we're still going to be have, having successful uh, returns and margins on these projects going forward. And so that firm now has a competitive advantage that they are in the largest developer of wind in North America. Um, because of that footprint, they're now trying to expand their, their upstream portfolio into um, you know, solar. And then with those assets, they're able to pair them now with batteries. So they're going to quickly become a leader in the battery space. So traditionally, you had a wind portfolio in West Texas, produced a lot of wind um, in the early morning hours and overnight, which is great. It's helpful. Um, Texas low tends to be during the afternoon, though, when it's really, really hot. If you pair that wind farm with a with solar apparatus, now suddenly you have a 24-7 um, basically base load asset that can be load following. And the valuation of that asset is only going to increase over time. And it's just a, it's just an add-on for you. You've already you have the lease on the land. You've paid for the infrastructure such that the transmission and distribution is there. You're just adding panels to land you've already had. So the landowners love it. The company loves it, and the offtaker gets lower, gets more renewable electricity at a lower price. Thank Great. you so much, Jerry. Yeah, we unfortunately we're running out of time. We could carry on this conversation for a long should, time. We should switch to the thought closing slides, Ron. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, actually, uh, Lenore, I got some. Thank you very much for that one. And I'm going to just switch to my screen in a moment as well. If you would, Lenore, just get so to let, Yeah, let's just, uh, so if anybody wants to get in touch with us, um, we would love to answer more questions. We would love to talk to you about investing in this space. Um, about how you can green your portfolio, um, compare it to your portfolio and let you know what the opportunities are um, and how we can help you with, I think Lenore showed you that the rate of returns are comparable if not better and certainly have performed better this year in the downturn. Um, the next slide, if you can go to that. Um, we provide financial wisdom to help our clients build sustainable futures. Um, work towards sustainable prosperity and multi-generational wealth and our biggest part and get them peace of mind. And the biggest part of our mission is that these decisions do not need to be made alone. Um, this is a picture pictures of our top six um, financial advisors and just flip for one more minute back to the slide before this, if people want to write down our phone number, 
but you can always look us up on the internet under Pell Wealth Partners or Jerry Pell. Um, and Ron, I'm going to let you close it out. I know we went a little bit over, but I think we got a lot of good value packed into something that, believe me, we could talk about for hours and hours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, so, yes, folks, so I'd like to just close it out with this since this is the last part of the series. Um, everyone can see this screen, I am hoping. So um, we live in a state where we are committed to 100% clean energy by 2040. Um, you saw in past pieces how Westchester is actually taking a lead on a host of solar with 7,000 solar projects, 118 megawatts, a doubling of commercial solar where people are taking advantage of getting leases on their roof space, on their parking lots, and on their grounds. So that means no capital out, just extra income. We saw as well the clean energy program on heating and cooling technologies where we have... Um, where we have Con Edison and other utilities having over half a million, half a billion dollars worth of incentives available. And again, a number of examples on heat, air source heat pumps. We saw as well as ground source heat pumps are now the cheapest source when you combine that with solar, the cheapest source of heating and cooling, less than natural gas on heating, cheaper on, on air conditioning. We saw how on transportation, we have a New York State energy program that now just announced, announced another $700 million of incentives to help people move to the electrification of transportation and how you could save money on that, how $61 billion is what we're spending per year in New York State on electricity, thermal heat, and transportation, and how that correlates almost directly with our greenhouse gas footprints. So as you look at every dollar that you're spending on energy, it's actually your greenhouse gas footprint, and there's a way to reduce that and save money. You can do it with outstanding returns on your investment of 10 to 30 percent. You could do it with North Cash Down Savings, and you could do it, as you found out with Jerry today, by doing investments with her firm and everyone else. Everybody is unique. How much are you spending on electricity, on heating, cooling, gas maintenance, et cetera? Take a look at those bills. That's your greenhouse gas footprint. If you have questions, I'm happy to help you. Um, I have uh, schedule openings this Thursday, 3, 4, 5, or 6 p.m., or this Friday at 8 or 9. Happy to have a conversation with you, talk about what you can do, help direct you, steer you, give me a call, or drop me an email. Um, don't forget, too, if you haven't responded to the sweepstakes and you would like to for your home, office, or your not designated nonprofit, get an energy consultation that helps them figure out how to save money and move to 100% climate neutral, zero net zero output. Give us a submit a, uh, an application just subscribe to that uh, the sweepstakes. There's the podcast that's out now every Thursday and actually Monday and Thursdays. And this Thursday is on Needlepoint Bipolar Ionization with the giant Atlantic Westchester um, has pushed forth as a very viable technology to eliminate COVID, eliminate viruses, eliminate bacteria in your workplaces and in your homes. And if you want to listen to that podcast, you can find out more tomorrow. Thank you, BCW. And on September 18th is the energy conference where all these technologies and more will be available. That's Friday, September 18th. Thank you, Pell Partners, for today and all the different things that you're doing. And thank you again to the panelists, Jerry Eisenman, Julie Wendholm from Pell, Lenore Reiner from Eaton Vance, John Wilson, John Miller from Calvert Social Research. Thank you, sponsors, Sunrise Solar, NYSERDA, Atlantic Westchester, Pell Wealth Partners. Thank you as well to DB and DBA and D Advertising for your help in helping to streamline my presentation and this, uh, this slide and the new logo. Thank you very much. And thank you always to Mike Dardano and Buzz Potential for putting this all out there. Thank you all. Um, this is recorded. The slides will be available. Sorry for the short run on everything. Um, lots we can talk about, and we look forward to doing it in the future. Marsha? And Ron came in on behalf of the Business Council of Westchester and all of us who have tuned in faithfully every week and watched on Facebook and in our Business Resource Center. Our gratitude to you for putting this incredible series together for us. And I will just say that I know the, the clients that you have working with you at EarthKind Energy Consulting, you, the, you are an amazing resource for the Hudson Valley. So I encourage anyone with any questions to call EarthKind Energy Consulting. Always encourage people interested in responsible investing to call Pell Wealth Partners. Ron came in, you're amazing. You did a great job. You've been a great host. Thank you so very much. Thank we wish you, you good health. Thanks, and everybody. And a great vacation. Keep Marshall. safe. And everyone, wear your masks. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.